This talk is based on a joint work with uh, Gilad Kohl, Shai Moran, Oliver Busquet, and Klim Yefremenko. Uh, and uh, the, I'll try to, uh, uh, to keep it uh, relatively simple. Please do stop. It's not, uh, I can skip some parts. So if there are questions, please stop me and uh, ask. Uh, I'll try to monitor the chat, but uh, definitely just, uh, it's not, there are only 30 people here, so you can just unmute yourself and speak. Um, so we are looking, uh, the, the, the problem we are looking at is hypothesis selection. So we have some observed phenomenon P and uh, we, we would like uh, to, to build a concise model uh, for it. Uh, so there are, we get some probabilistic observations and uh, we say that uh, a model Q is a good model for P if we cannot distinguish observation from Q from uh, observations from P. So specifically, let's say we have N candidates. So N you should think of as large because we'll really try hard to be logarithmic and then and uh, we would like to automatically determine which model better explains P. Uh, so this is the abstraction of this is the hypothesis selection problem. So, uh, so to, to phrase it more formally, we have an hypothesis. We have P, which is an unknown distribution. We can push a button and get samples from P. And uh, the goal is to determine uh, which of the QI is closest to P in total variation distance. So total variation means it's just like up to factor two is the same as statistical distance. It's the maximum observable statistical distance you can get over any subset. And uh, our goal is to be correct, of course, but the secondary goal is to do it as in few samples as possible. So this is gonna be a sample complexity talk. We are not gonna talk about computational issues at all. It's, it's, uh, today it's gonna be purely a statistical question. Uh, okay, so, let, so some bad news first. Uh, let's uh, as stated it's uh, it's impossible even with n equals to two so let's say we have two distributions q1 and q2 and we want to find basically which one is closer to p in total variation distance um, so the naive approach that doesn't work is to estimate the total variation distance and this is so uh if uh if X is finite, it requires basically the size of X samples, more or less. And if X is infinite, then it's just impossible. So for example, uh, given a distribution, uh, given samples from uh, the interval zero one, we can't tell if it's from, by looking at a finite number of samples, uh, whether we are getting truly uniform points or uniform points from some weird subset of the zero one interval. And this actually, uh, it, it, it means that, okay, so maybe now we, we, we should be lucky to get anything, but it also shows that uh, it's, a, it's a hard problem. So for example, we cannot expect to get the exact precise uh, answer. We, we can only approximate it. So yeah, so... Uh, so, and uh, uh, the, the main theorem we'll mostly prove today or at least kind of outline is the following. So there is an improper algorithm. So it outputs some distribution Q that is not in the set of Q1, QN, such that the total variation distance of Q from our target P. So there is a multiplicative factor two from the optimal and there is an additive epsilon. And two here is, a, is special in the sense that this is the best you can do. So, uh, so it's twice the optimal total variation distance plus epsilon where the query complexity scales with N. So that to be expected that you need at least log N samples to just uh, determine which class we are uh, divided by epsilon square. And this is optimal up to constant factors, everything here. Uh, so some, very abridged history in the paper. So this was in uh, Fox uh, 2021. And uh, so 
just some of the main results. So uh, if you're looking for a proper algorithm, so you want to output one of the queues, the best you can do is a factor three. And uh, so that can be done with a three instead of a two and proper. And an improper algorithm, so there was a previous paper, uh, previous recent paper that, sh that basically followed some of the same logic we had, we'll see today, achieving two times optimum, but requiring a polynomial number of samples in the N uh, instead of a logarithmic. So the dependence on epsilon is also slightly suboptimal, but the main thing is that you get root N instead of uh, log N. And uh, it used uh, adaptive data analysis, which is something that I'll mention towards the end of the talk uh, as something that would be very reasonable to use, but somehow doesn't seem to be the right tool here. So we'll Mark, will, will you mention how you prove the lower bound that two and three are optimal? Uh, I will not, so uh, because I don't remember it off the top of my head, it's roughly following the same logic as why you can't estimate total variation distance. Uh, okay. But it's, it's purely information theoretic, at least the two, so I don't remember exactly, but, uh, uh, but it's tight in the sense that two is like the new one. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, the actually the lower bound is in in, in the same previous paper, uh, even for improper algorithms. But uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't remember off the top of my head how to show it. Uh, kind of got used to the fact that this is the best you can do. I found it in region also in the beginning. Uh, Okay, so basically what is the high level idea uh, and kind of we'll go over it several times, but uh, how can we get any kind of a handle on uh, statistical distances? So, so we cannot measure total variation distance, but we can measure uh, a surrogate distance over any set family of subsets. So if, if uh, you take a similar family of subsets F, I can measure a distance DF by taking the supremum of the difference or the maximum if F is finite, the maximum of the differences uh, that P and Q measure on that set. And uh, it has the same properties as total variation distance. It has the triangle inequality. It lower bounds total variation, so because those are specific sets, and it's equality if, if we take all the subsets, but it's always a lower bound. And unlike total variation, this is estimable pretty efficiently. So if uh, I can do it, estimate uh, df of p with respect to uh, uh, to q using only log f over epsilon square samples. And potentially even less if you have some VC dimension. But uh, for our purposes, the important thing is this log f over epsilon square bound. Uh, okay, so now we're uh, so the main object that we'll be looking at uh, is uh, the distances vector. So this is the main definition, and we'll see why it's useful in a moment. So. Currently, it's just uh, it's just an abstract definition for a distribution Q. I can I can calculate the n total variation distances between Q and Q1, Q and Q2, and so on, and define this vector to be v of Q. And uh, similarly, we can define v f of Q, uh, where we use the surrogate distance with f instead of the total variation distance. For now, it's not clear why it's useful, but it will be become clear in a couple of minutes. So uh, this is Q, those are the distances, and then the V of Q vector is 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6 in this picture. So for every Q, uh, we associate the vector. And uh, so here is why the Q observation that shows where the factor two comes from. So let's say we, we have a, known class of distributions, and we have a target distribution P. So here's a key observation. If we found some Q 
uh, that satisfies v of q is bounded by v of p plus epsilon, then q is a good uh, hypothesis for p. In particular, the total variation of q and p is less than twice the optimal plus epsilon. And uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll prove it in a second in the space in between, but uh, why is it a good news? Because it's now, uh, now instead of thinking about P, which is a very complicated object potentially, we are down to talking about V of P. Because if I found the Q such that V of Q is dominated by V of P plus Epsilon, that by this Q observation, we are done. And- Mark, can I ask a question? Yes. Is that a point-wise inequality for V of yes. Q? Yes, so it's a point-wise and n dimensions. So it's really n inequalities. Okay. Uh, sorry, this inequality is just numbers. Uh, this inequality, when, when it's, it's vectors, then it's a point-wise inequality. But now, uh, basically, we instead of... Uh, all we have to do is, is uh, essentially understand V of P. And as, as, so as long as we find the Q that satisfies this, we are done. Uh, we don't, uh, so that's all we need to ever know about P. And we'll see exactly how it plays out soon. Okay, so let's prove this Q observation. It's, it's a two line proof. Uh, so suppose QI is, is uh, the point that realizes opt. So it's the total variation of P and QI is the optimal one. So this is uh, the distance from P to QI is the optimal distance. The distance between Q and QI is at most by, by this domination condition, it's at most the uh, VPI plus epsilon. So it's at most opt plus epsilon. And so by triangle inequality, the distance between P and Q is at most two op plus epsilon. So, uh, so all we have to do now is uh, to find a, a distribution Q uh, that is dominated, whose distances are dominated by the distances of P plus epsilon. So uh, we can now plot it. So this is the n-dimensional space, what we see here. Uh, each point represents uh, potential total variation distances between Q and uh, all the QIs. So here it's a two-dimensional picture. So the x-axis is the total variation distance from Q, Q1, and the y-axis is the uh, distance from Q2. So we can define QTV is, is the set of all possible uh, pairs of total variation distances from Q1 and Q2. So this is the set. Any point here can be, any distribution corresponds to a point here. And any point here can be realized by some distribution. And moreover, this is a purely, there is no querying. If I give you a point here, you can give me Q by just cal calculation. So this is, uh, there is just a mapping that takes all possible abstract distributions that can be very complicated, but assigns it an n-dimensional non-negative vector corresponding to the distances. Uh, and uh, so moreover for every F, we also get uh, the possible vectors of distances as estimated by the set F, this estimate is always potentially losses. So this, uh, the, the set QF is always larger than the set or larger or equal than the set QTV. Uh, and uh, okay, so it's very easy to see that it's convex. It's upwardly closed by definition. It's convex because we can take uh, linear combinations of, uh, so if two points are realized by two distributions, the line be between them can be realized by taking convex combinations of those distributions or potentially you do even, so yeah, basically that's why it's convex. Uh, for every FQF is convex, it's also upwardly closed and uh, QF contains QTV. So we have some very nice convex structure. And uh, now let's just, uh, 
so that we can stop talking about statistics and start, start talking about convex geometry. Uh, let's recall what does the key observation map to here. So uh, the key observation that uh, allowed us to get this two factor was that if you find the Q that satisfies V of Q dominated by V of P plus Epsilon, we are done. So V of P, P is some distribution. It corresponds to a point inside QTV. And uh, so let's say this point. So all we have to do is to find the Q that is in this green triangle. Any point in this green triangle is good enough for us because it satisfies it's dominated by V of P plus Epsilon. Uh, in practice, uh, okay, so how will it manifest? Of course, if we knew what V of P is, we would, we would be done, right? We will never find out what V of P is. That was the second, literally the second slide of this talk was, we are not gonna find out what V of P is. We cannot estimate total variation distances. Instead, the goal will, uh, our goal will be to trap V of P inside or close to QTV. And if you find the proof, what would the proof look like? It would say V of P is at least something. So you can output the Q that corresponds to this something. So the moment you have a proof that V of P is inside of QTV, you can take this proof and convert it into a Q that is dominated by V of P plus epsilon. So this is kind of, uh, this is what it amounts to. So uh, we, we do it, so this leads naturally to an iterative algorithm. We want to find the Q uh, in this uh, purple region. Uh, and what we do is we produce a sequence of uh, regions such that, uh, Basically, we produce a, a sequence of estimates. Every time, every subsequent estimate is better than the previous one. So we start by saying that V of P is at least zero in every coordinate. So that's not a very impressive estimate. And every time we improve the estimate by at least epsilon and at least one coordinate. And if you manage to make progress like this, right? So every time, uh, basically we say, okay, are we there yet? Are we inside? If not, I haven't told you how, but we somehow managed to produce an X estimate U4 and so on. Every time we make at least epsilon progress in at least one coordinate. And so uh, eventually, and I promise you that this process can continue as long as we are not inside TV. And the invariant that we maintain is UI uh, is VFP, so it's dominated by VP. And uh, so the moment we are inside, we can terminate, we get a point that's dominated by VP plus Epsilon and uh, we succeed. And as long as this, uh, we'll do much better later, but even with this naive estimate that we are making at least Epsilon progress on at least one coordinate, we stop after a finite number of steps after N over Epsilon. Eventually we'll make it more like log N, but uh, this will take some time. Okay, so uh, how do you produce UI from UI minus one? Well, there is this, the following separation theorem. So UI minus one says, oh, I'm, we are not done yet. What does it mean that we are not done yet? It means that this set C here, which takes UI and extends it by epsilon in every direction, it does not touch QTV because if it did touch, then I would take the upper right corner and declare this to be the Q, the V of Q and output it. And, uh, and that would be it. So we are, uh, we are not done means your I, this entire region C is, uh, is disjoint from QTV. And uh, there is a separation theorem, which we'll, we'll see in intuition for in a minute, that says that uh, you can always separate by, uh, there is a Q of F that separates this C from QTV. And moreover, F contains at most N, um, at most n sets. So there is a short proof that, because this is a convex set and this is a convex set, there is a short proof that, uh, that separates them. And we can, uh, so basically now we, we have a VF. We know that VF of P will land us inside this QF region. And this can be estimated uh, using order log n samples from P. And this will give us a new point VF of P that has to be inside of this QF region because P is a real distribution. Q 
QF is the set of all possible distances under F that are realized by any possible distribution. So we know that VF of P is guaranteed to be inside. So we're in good shape. So we get VF of P. And uh, now we take a pointwise maximum between the previous point and the current one. And because the f of p is outside of c, we know that we made at least epsilon progress in at least one coordinate. And uh, so we can continue. So let me give you some intuition about the separation. It's a, so here's a very simple example. x is uh, the set one, two, three. q1 is the, and it will also help maybe with intuition for a few previous slides. q1 is the, constant this atomic distribution that puts all its weight on the first element. Q2 puts all its weight on the second element. So QTV is, is uh, the picture is this uh, uh, purple region on the right, because we know that no matter what distribution Q is, it, it has to differ uh, from Q1 and Q2 by at least one. Right, because Q1 puts all its mass on the first element, Q2 puts all its mass on the second element, you cannot put all your mass simultaneously. So this is QTV. And this fact is witnessed, in fact, by F, which is one and two. So this is QF, and it's not always this neat. It's not always that, of course, you can uh, witness it with only one constraint, but this is the picture. And now when P arrives, I can test it on just one and two and say it says 0.4 on one, 0.5 on two. I immediately know that the total variation with Q1 is at least 0.6 and the total variation with Q2 is at least 0.5. And I get to put UI here above the green line. Uh, and of course the epsilon comes in because there is gonna be an error. So I'll have to move it a little bit less, but uh, basically that's, that's the idea. And uh, basically, okay, so where does, uh, to demystify the separator a little bit, uh, omitting some details, okay, so those, C is a convex box, QTV is a convex box, there is always a linear separator between them. And moreover, because QTV is uh, upward bounded, this, uh, uh, this is a monotone linear separator. So all uh, the gradient is all non-negative kind of the orthogonal direction is all non-negative. Um, and uh, the separation lemma can be rephrased by saying that there is a statistical test uh, that witnesses this separation. So there is a statistical test that gives a simple proof to the fact that every distribution has to be above this green line, the statistical distances. Just like in the previous slide here, the, uh, just looking at the points one and two was uh, witnessed enough that you cannot simultaneously be very close to Q1 and very close to Q2. Uh, this, is, this fact is true in general. There is some statistical test that witnesses this separation. And so when we run this test, the, we will get a point on that, this VFP on the other side of the line and UI gets to be a pointwise maximum. So UI is definitely on the other side of the line. So basically the game is we draw a line, we get a point outside uh, on the other side of the line and we continue. And it's not just, uh, okay, so uh, the separator no longer separates UI from QTV. And moreover, because of the slack epsilon, even, even things that are close to this, this line cannot separate it because, because, uh, uh, because UI is above the separator. So UI plus epsilon is even more so above the separator. So even things that are close to the separator don't, uh, to the old separator don't separate anymore. And this will be useful for the dual view because in the primal, our goal is to get UI into TV. In the dual, our goal is to run out of separators. So if you look at the set of all eligible separators, uh, the, just because of duality, the set of eligible separators is convex. 
And every time we select an eligible separator, we do something, we do some statistical separation, lemma, whatever. We do something, it makes this separator no longer eligible, and even its neighborhood is no longer eligible. And this somehow uh, uh, will, will allow us to make much faster progress because the goal is, remember we said that we can do it in n over epsilon iterations, the goal is to be logarithmic in n. So that's, uh, that's the plan is to run out of separators. So if you were lost, so we did two transformations uh, with going from the statistical problem to some convex geometry problem to its dual. Uh, so now it's a, for the last 10 minutes or 15 minutes of the talk, you can, uh, it's a good place to reconvene because this is a game that is self-contained, just there, it has something to do with the process selection, but it's a natural game in its own right. So this is the cutting with the margin game. So this is the primal game. We'll in a second move to the dual game. So the primal game is there is a set and uh, And uh, the player, the primal player, uh, okay, so the dual player will pick points. So um, actually there is no reason. Okay, so this is the game that I just described. Let me not go over it in detail because I want to move to the dual game right away. So there is a game that corresponds to what I, uh, to the progression of UIs. Let me state the dual game, and I promise that. Uh, okay, so we'll spend, we'll sp uh, explain it um, in more detail. So here is the dual game. This is the game that we really care about. So we have a norm in R D. Uh, we have a subset, uh, and the game starts as following. In the beginning, uh, there is the set B zero, which is a unit ball. At every point. The player, the primal, the, the, the player picks a point inside the current set. The adversary picks a half space that excludes the point and its neighborhood. And you, uh, you remove that half space. And the, the player wants to be clever in the selection of XIs such that uh, BI is exhausted as fast as possible. So here is uh, here's a picture. And the, the distance we'll want is at the L1 distance. So you start with an L1 ball. So in round one, the player picks cleverly the middle point. So the adversary is forced to cut, basically needs to produce a half space that excludes this entire blue region. It's cut. The player again produce, uh, picks the middle, cut, middle. Okay, now it's less clever, but to, to give us a couple more rounds. Cut, cut, and uh, now we are done, right? So the now the last step always covers the entire region. So we are done, we, we get the empty set. So this is the cutting game. The, uh, uh, and uh, one step in this cutting game corresponds to how do you select the separator uh, in the process selection problem. So uh, basically the number of steps in the cutting game gets multiplied by some, something logarithmic and that's the number of samples that we need to get to two times optimal plus epsilon. So, okay, how fast can we win the cutting game? So the naive strategy actually turns out that if you don't know how to play and you play arbitrarily, there is a limit on how badly you can do because uh, remember in the primal game, if at least you make an epsilon progress in at least one coordinate every step, you cannot lose. You, you have to finish in at most 10 over epsilon steps. And it turns out that playing arbitrarily still gets you there in n over epsilon steps, even if you try, do, do not try to be clever at all. Uh, it turns out that you can do kind of logarithmically and then instead of uh, polynomially. And uh, here is a general strategy. You have your set B, you want to make it smaller and smaller. So you take a concave function psi on B 
And take xi to be the maximizer of this concave function. So it's the maximizer because it's a concave function. Let's say if it's strongly concave, it has a single maximizer. So every time you pick a maximizer, the adversary has to cut it from the set together with its neighborhood. So the next maximizer will be smaller, hopefully smaller by some amount. So it gets smaller and smaller until it vanishes and then we are done. And more, so if we are able to prove a lower bound, on how by how much each step when you uh, reduces this uh, concave function, then we get an upper bound on the number of steps, and this is exactly what we do. So in the case of in in the case that interests us, we, uh, we can replace because uh, we can replace the entire L1 ball with just the simplex. So we look at all the points that add up to one with the L1 norm. And then psi, we can take Shannon's entropy. And it turns out to work really well. So the maximum entropy over the simplex is log n, is the uniform distribution. And OK, so uh, it turns out that it, it's actually surprisingly simple to show that we make good progress in terms of entropy reduction. So we know that, so xi will be the maximizer over the current set of eligible separators over the current set that we are still holding we, we we view it as a set of distributions and we take the one with the maximum entropy and we know that every time we remove an epsilon ball in l1 matrix so we know that this maximizer and the next maximizer differ by at least epsilon in statistical distance right because we cut xi together with its neighborhood and uh, okay, so it turns out that here is a, the, that you can show that the entropy has to drop by at least epsilon squared. So here is a brief proof. So for the it's it's fun if you've seen kind of information theory arguments before. Uh, I found at least one more use of it for this trick since. So maybe it's it's nice to see. If not, then uh, if you haven't seen this, it will be too fast. But uh, here's what we do. We consider the following process. We want to show that the distribution, when you go from xi to xi plus one, your entropy drops by at least epsilon squared. So we consider the following experiment. Let S be just uh, the Bernoulli, the, a fair coin that tells us which it selects between xi and xi plus one. So the random variable capital X here will be distributed according to xi if s is zero and according to xi plus one is, uh, if s is one. Uh, so xi pri x prime is the distribution of x. So Pinsker's inequality tells us that the KL divergence, uh, because the statistical distance between xi and x prime is at least epsilon, on the order of epsilon, the KL divergence between xi and x prime and xi plus one and x prime is at least epsilon squared. And this means that there is non-trivial mutual information between X and the selector variable. So basically X, remember, is selected between Xi and Xi plus one. And if you know that Xi and Xi plus one are not the same thing, they have some statistical distance, then knowing S should tell us something about X. If you tell me, that whether knowing whether it's xi or xi plus one does reveal some information about x and that's all we are saying here um, so the there is the mutual information between x and s and okay now we just uh, rewrite the what is mutual information is the entropy of x minus the entropy of x given s which is in this case it's the entropy of this x prime minus the entropy of xi plus entropy of xi plus one over two because that's the entropy given excess. And now, uh, finally, uh, entropy of x prime, x prime was one possible candidate in step i. So entropy of x prime is less than or equal to the entropy of xi. So we get to say that this is less than xi plus one. So h of x prime minus h of xi is less than H of xi. And uh, 
Okay, so just uh, moving things around, we get that the entropy drops by at least epsilon squared. Uh, so uh, it's a very kind of short argument uh, and requiring no calculations, basically. Um, you could do it from first principles with logs, but the but it's possible to avoid it altogether. So we get that this immediately gives us for the cut in this margin game an upper bound of log n over epsilon square on the number of rounds because what we got is in the beginning your entropy is at least at more is log n every time it drops by at least epsilon squared and it's always non negative so this is how many rounds you can survive with this very simple strategy of going back to the the picture pick a separator for whom if you look at the if you write the slope, the orthogonal slope as a distribution, find the separator with the highest entropy. And that, that's the strategy that somehow seems to work best. So uh, putting it back together, this gives us an upper bound of log square run over epsilon to the fourth on the number of queries, which, if, uh, which is suboptimal. And it does require additional work that is not as clean but to get to the optimal log n over epsilon square. So technically it's more demanding. Basically uh, the reason, so it is true and I'm convinced that you cannot improve that step that you need this many iterations of this process. But in the beginning, somehow you don't need a very precise estimate. So, uh, so we are allow, if we allow ourselves to make mistakes that we'll correct later, we can do better. We don't, basically we don't need to use a union bound over the rounds and that's what allows us to save this. I would like, it would have, it would be nice to have, okay, let, let me talk about it in, uh, in, in the discussion. Uh, I think this is, this is an interesting direction to understand it better. So this cutting with margin game makes sense in other norms. And it seems like you can do pretty well with, uh, so you, if you're LP and not L1, then it's Bregman divergence instead of KL divergence. But still the same idea of maximizing divergence seems to, uh, to give a, a good strategy. So, uh, uh, and the next uh, point is this connection to adaptive data analysis. So basically at the high level, what we do is run a bunch of tests. So every time we produce UI, UI plus one, to get from UI to UI plus one, we produce, we do a bunch of tests. And uh, if you, uh, so every, okay. So if you don't want to, to have a complicated life, every time you use fresh samples. So every time, uh, we need to estimate UI plus one. We draw fresh samples from P and that's what we use to estimate those distances. You could think that there is no reason unless, so it's true that the new hypothesis, the new says that we need to test a generated on the basis of previous ones, but somehow maybe it's not too bad. Maybe we could reuse the same data. Um, so using ideas from adaptive data analysis and indeed in previous works, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's been one of the ingredients, but it doesn't seem to be strong enough for our purposes. So it seems that you cannot get rid, you cannot go all the way to log n over epsilon squared using adaptive data analysis. And it would be nice to either see if it can be, it, it is strong enough, or whether somehow we, it can be strengthened uh, to work. Uh, in our case, maybe there is something uh, kind of, uh, the missing piece can be generalized to something that uh, that is true for adaptive data analysis in general. So uh, thank you.